Today we're going to see how God took people from all levels of life and found a way to make it all even. Now, we are used to people living at different levels of life. A lot of it is unspoken, a lot of it's nuanced, but that's not always the case. Some of it is really quite obvious. When someone pulls up to a social gathering in a brand new $100,000 car, a statement of level is being made. When someone posts pictures of their month-long vacation skiing the Alps and cruising around Santorini and playing blackjack in Monte Carlo, a statement of level is being made. It's pretty common, and we've all, we've all gotten used to that kind of stuff. It's fine. Um, a while back, I used to be in a pastor's small group in the area, and I loved it. A lot of good men and women were a part of the group. We would gather monthly, and I was probably the oldest guy in the group. And I have been at this for a long time, and I've been uh, serving in multiple environments, many different types of staff dynamics, so I've kind of seen it all. And I'm old enough to not be compelled to jockey for position. I just don't care enough about that. So being a little bit detached, I watched a very, very certain dynamic take place. As we ate and we talked and we discussed some topics that were very specific to our ministry worlds, a quiet pecking order was established. Um, and that pecking order was not based on experience or perceived talent or calling or any other of those vague, unquantifiable metrics. Um, the pecking order was based on one thing and one thing only. It was the size of the church that we were leading. No kidding. Deference was given to those who pastored larger churches than the other people in the room. And I kind of chuckled as I watched this whole thing take place. Uh, and really, at the time, we were quite a bit larger than we are now. Um, it was long pre-COVID, and so at that time, we really fit right into the middle of the spectrum that was represented in, the, in that pastor's group. But the ground was not level there. It just wasn't. Those on the top kind of enjoyed their influence, and those that were kind of on the lower end were left looking up and kind of hoping for the best. And there was me in the midst of all these young, ambitious leaders kind of giggling because I just really didn't give a rip about it. Now, I'm not saying that I was above that in any way. I'm not. At, at certain points in my life, I'm sure I would have been subject to those kind of feelings. I'm just kind of not anymore. So now here's the deal. You can probably think of an, an arena of life that you're familiar with where this kind of dynamic takes place, whether it's among medical professionals or soccer moms or golf buddies or maybe other board members of a particular organization, rarely is the ground level. A pecking order is usually present. Now, every once in a while, by some outside force, that ground gets leveled. And it's good news. It's a good thing when that kind of thing happens. But not everybody sees it that way. Not by a long shot. One guy I met that told about a great example of this. In February 2018, Billy Graham passed away. And in Charlotte of the same year, March 2nd, um, his memorial service, the funeral, was scheduled. And it was to be in Charlotte, North Carolina. Only 2,000 people could fit at this event. So the, the invitations went out to only 1,000 people who could each bring a plus one. Now, with a zillion people wanting to be a part of that event to celebrate that extraordinary life and that amazing ministry, it was a pretty tough ticket. Again, only 1,000 people are being invited. So in that crowd were political figures and TV personalities, world-renowned pastors and ministry leaders, five presidents and celebrities of all kinds, all kinds of influential people. It was like a who's who of public life. And there, these were all people that were mostly big shots somewhere. People who are used to traveling in motorcades, pulling up in a big line of Cadillac Escalades and their entourage coming out, the security people coming out with the sunglasses on and all that kind of stuff. But the beauty of this day was you couldn't bring your people. Your people were not welcome. <laughs> there was no room for them. So the way they handled these top of the food, food chain individuals was they had them all come to a big parking lot about 20 minutes away from the event. And they all had to stand there for over an hour waiting to be bussed in. They had to wait for shuttle buses. So you've got 
all these important people and suddenly they can't be important because they're surrounded by all kinds of other important people. So nobody's important on that day. They all have to wait just like everybody else. Then, this is funny, they all get hoarded on the buses and they're told to go to the back of the bus and fill every single seat from the back all the way forward. And these people have not probably been on a bus since some elementary school. So March 2nd, Charlotte, North Carolina, sunny day, but it is freezing cold. And the service is held in an outdoor tent with no sides, so the wind's blowing through and everybody was just freezing. So all these famous people, but nobody's famous that day. I mean, there might be big shots on TV or in politics or in business, but hey, you're no Billy Graham, right? <laughs> Very few people are. I mean, think about this. Billy Graham preached an event in Korea. A million people were present. A mil there, there, there are pictures of it. A million people he spoke to. So on the day of this memorial service, uh, this guy said one of the most amazing things about it was that you could tell among the spectators who was really, really uncomfortable, who didn't like this at all. I mean, they were used to being big shots in their world, and now they weren't so special. Just kind of the level, level playing field is what they were dealing with. Now, if you think about this, at Christmas, the coming of Jesus, it leveled the playing field. And here's why. The angel in the skies over Bethlehem said these words. It said, today in the city of David, a savior has been born to you. And this savior comes not just for the downtrodden, but for everybody. It doesn't come just for the elite. It comes for everybody. It doesn't come just for those who believe that they're really, really good and they get it right all the time, but for everybody. Those that mess up, those who blew it, those who knew better and still blew it anyway. He came for those who never even considered themselves part of the in crowd of spiritual elite, people who have laughed off spiritual things in the past, even those who wonder why they should even stick around to live for another day. He came for us all. And the angel in the sky said these words as well. He said, the coming of Jesus would be good news of great joy for all people, for all people. And we touched on this last week, how, how in the world news that's so good could still be resisted. I mean, because I get it, when you hear bad news, you kind of hope that it's not true. You don't want it to be true, but it, that's human nature. But the opposite is also true. When you hear good news, you hope it's true, don't you? You want it to be true. You lean in to hear more because you're hoping that it's true. So the message of Christmas, the message of the coming of Jesus, is the best news ever. I mean, it's truly good news. So then, why do so many resist it? Why do so many doubt it? Why do so many reject it, mock it, ignore it? We blame a lot of that on the devil, but the real answer is actually a little bit simpler than that. And it's this. Lots of people have only heard a version of the good news, that doesn't look real good to them at all. Because the real original version of the message of Jesus has gotten so distanced from our cultural version of it, it's caused some catastrophic problems. I mean, you even get to a point where you have people today saying, I don't even care if it's true. I don't care. I don't wanna be a Christian. I've seen that, I don't want any part of it, no thanks. Now think about this, if you've been a follower of Jesus for a pretty long time, for, for my whole Christian life, when we try to share the good news with, with somebody else, we tend to focus on proving that Christianity is true, proving that the Bible is true, that it's historically accurate, that it really happened. And there are, there are ever-increasing proofs that show that the Bible is historically accurate. I mean, they, they, they found 2,000-year-old scrolls that affirm the accuracy of the Bible writings, like it hasn't changed in 2,000 years, like some people thought and other people accused. Oh, it's, it's just evolved over the years. It hasn't. They found 2,000-year-old scrolls to prove that it's accurate. The, the, the historicity of the Bible is proven to be so much more valuable than tons of other historical writings that we accept with no questions asked. So that's, that's one thing. And we used to, by and large, we would try to convince the unconvinced that Christianity is, is true. It's true. And if it is true, well then, of course you'll accept it. There's a lot at stake. 
So I grew up thinking, if I could just convince my friends that Christianity is true, that the Bible is true, that they'll immediately fall down and worship Jesus. Has that ever happened? No. Why? First of all, you can't debate somebody into the kingdom of God. No atheist has ever lost a debate and then dropped to their knees. That just doesn't happen. They've got to be drawn by the Holy Spirit. It is a supernatural, whole person endeavor, not just an intellectual one. Because now, people can hear a compelling argument for the accuracy of the Bible, why it's smart to believe in Jesus, and they can respond by saying, I don't care. I don't want to believe. I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to be a church person. It might be true that I don't, but I don't care. I mean, I don't give a rip about the consequences. I've known some church people, and I don't want anything to do with that. They've heard a version of the message that they don't see as good news. And I, maybe if I'd heard what they had heard, I wouldn't believe either. I don't know. I mean, some Christians look like they've been sucking on a pickle for 20 years. The joy of the Lord isn't exactly erupting out of a lot of Christians these days. And for some people, you know what is erupting out of them? Self-righteousness, judgmentalism, superiority, cluelessness, even sometimes contempt for the very people that we are called to love because God loves them. He bankrupted heaven for them. Don't forget, good news of great joy for all people. Jesus has come to invite us into a life that's better than we deserve. Eternal life that, that actually starts now. And you don't have to pay for it with your good behavior or your money or your good intentions. Because we all have the best of intentions, don't we? Matter of fact, we judge the people around us by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our own good intentions, which is highly unfair. <laughs> but now, none of those levels of behavior matters at all. A savior has come because we all need a savior. We see that the, the ground is indeed made level before God. No matter your upbringing, your social status, your economic status, your religious upbringing, we all need a savior. At Christmas, God addressed our true need. He sent the savior that we needed. That's the real Christmas story. That's the real Jesus who came for us. Not to show us how we can finally live in a way to keep God from getting mad at us. Not even to point the way. To be the way. There's a difference. No wonder Jesus made such an impact in such a short period of time. Because everywhere Jesus went, crowds piled up on top of crowds on top of crowds just to listen to him teach the good news of the kingdom of God. Now remember last week we, we looked at this verse when Jesus was teaching and he said these words, the law and the prophets were, were proclaimed up until John. He's talking about John the Baptist there, which is also the same time that Jesus came on the scene. So he's saying the law and the prophets had been preached all of the millennia up until now, but he continues this by saying, but since that time, meaning since I've come, since that time, the good news of the kingdom. In other words, it's all, it's all changed. It's all changed. Since that time I have stepped into the world, I've begun to teach the good news of the kingdom of God. What God is truly like, what, how God truly loves, how God really wants to be in a loving, trusting friendship with all people. And now he was making a way for that to take place for our sake, for our benefit. So we don't share the, the good news of the law and the prophets. We share the good news of Jesus because it's truly good news for all people. So if the life and message of Jesus doesn't strike you as good news, maybe you've never heard the real original good news. The life and the message of Jesus should stir something in you that just says, wow, wouldn't it be great if that were true? Could it really be true? Forgiveness? Acceptance? Wouldn't that be amazing? It is amazing. And it is true. And it is good news of great joy for all people. Now, one of, the, one of the things that makes the good news so good is that Jesus basically leveled the playing field. No differing spiritual levels for differing people. 
the message of Jesus was seen as humbling and disturbing news, a disturbing reminder that we actually aren't all that good. We don't get it right all the time. And that reality gave hope to people who already knew that they weren't all that good. Like ordinary people like me, who have some stuff in life's rearview mirror that we wish wasn't there. Stuff we wish we could forget. I don't think I'm alone in that. Suddenly Jesus shows up, and then all the excuses burn away, and we realize what we're really like and what we're really capable of, and Jesus just says, I know, I know, that's why I came. Let's be honest, our falling short, it's not always an accident, is it? Sometimes we fall short on purpose, and we call it a mistake. In our culture, we call it a mistake. He made a mistake. He stumbled. Yeah, he stumbled 47 times. Is there even a thing such as a premeditated stumble where you like plan it out and then you execute it and you actually do it? Not really, not really. That's what's known as, it's known as sin. That's sin. Where we fall short of God's perfection and we all fall short. Nobody is exempt from that one. And Jesus would say, let's just be honest, okay? You're not mistakers, you're not stumblers, you're sinners. And that's why I came. Truth is, we don't need a second chance. We don't need a mulligan. We need a savior. We don't need an improvement of life. We need someone to give us life. We need a savior. Now, the birth of Jesus was good news of great joy for all people because we all share something in common. We all fall short, and we've all been invited to embrace the solution for our falling shortedness, Jesus, and Jesus alone. Remember, we talked about this last week. There are no self-righteous Jesus followers because Jesus himself removed that option. We cannot follow Jesus and hang on to a shred of self-righteousness. All right. Near the end of that Billy Graham memorial service, his daughter Ruth got up to speak. All the kids spoke, but when Ruth got up, uh, she got kind of real in front of everyone, and she said this. She said, after 21 years, my marriage ended in divorce and I was devastated. I floundered, I did wrong. The rug was pulled out from under me. My family thought it would be a good idea if I moved away and got a fresh start somewhere else. So I did, she said. Not long after, I was introduced to a handsome man and we began to date. It moved too fast and my children didn't like him, but I thought, they're almost grown, they don't know, they can't tell me what to do, and I know what's best for my life. Both my mom and dad, she said, called me and just kind of said, honey, why don't you slow this down? Let's take some time and get to know this man. But they'd never been single, she said. They'd never been a single parent and they'd never been divorced. What do they know? So being, this is what she said. She said, being stubborn, willful, and sinful, I married this man on New Year's Eve. And within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled because I was afraid of him. So now what was I going to do? I wanted to talk to my mother and my father really badly, but I'd rejected their advice. After a while, I decided to go to them anyway. And questions swirled in my mind. What was I going to say to my dad? What was I going to say to my mother? What was I going to say to my kids? I'd been such a failure. And what were they going to say to me? Like, we're tired of this. We told you not to do it. You've embarrassed us. Then she said, some of you will understand this. You don't want to embarrass your father. And I certainly didn't want to embarrass Billy Graham. But I went anyway. So my parents live on the side of a mountain. As I wound around that mountain, around the last bend of my dad's driveway, my father was standing there waiting for me. As I got out of the car, he wrapped his arms around me and he just said, welcome home. There was no shame, no blame, no condemnation, just we love you. And she says, and I know my father was not God. But he showed me what God was like that day. When we come to God with our sin and our brokenness and our failures, God just says, welcome home. Now that, friends, that's a reflection of good news, of great joy for all people. Doesn't matter the messes that we've made. He stands there open arms, wanting to receive us back and make it all all better because he can. 
That's a good news of Christmas right there.